All right, how's it going guys? So we bought Atticus 2 because we knew that she would be a really good platform for what we want to do for the next 10 years, which is you know try to sail around the world or at least explore a lot of it by sailboat. And so we know that the boat's big enough for our future family plans. She sails really well, she's built really strong. But from the very beginning, we knew that we would have to upgrade several components of the electrical system if we were going to live self-sufficiently at anchor, off grid, and out underway sailing. And after thinking about it for a little while, we realized that we wanted to take this opportunity to build from the ground up our dream electrical system. And over the course of the next couple videos, we're going to be doing a deep dive into what I think is one of the most cutting edge electrical systems that's possible for the modern cruising sailboat. And we're also gonna take you along on the journey of what it was like to get there. So hope you guys enjoy it. So on Atticus One, we had to make huge sacrifices in terms of giving up the vast majority of modern luxuries and amenities that you would find in just an average American household. We didn't have pressurized water, we didn't have hot water, we didn't have very much water, so we had to be really, really conservative when showering or doing dishes. We definitely didn't have air conditioning. It got super hot inside of that boat. We had a refrigerator, but it was really small and it was one of the largest electrical loads and we didn't have a freezer. So it was really hard for us to keep large amounts of meats for us to go off grid for long periods of time. We didn't have a lot of little luxuries like coffee pots, vacuum cleaners, and also running a YouTube channel is a lot like running a small business. So it was really difficult for us to run two editing laptops all day long for days at a time sometimes. We had to run the engine sometimes five hours a day to keep up with that electrical demand. Now don't get me wrong, we had a blast on Atticus One. We had tons of awesome adventures and it was well worth those sacrifices. But having lived that way for seven years, we kind of want to experiment with this boat, with Atticus Two, to see if it's possible for us to cruise, sail, see the world, and to do it with a lot of those modern amenities. And to give you an example, for the couple of months that we've owned Atticus 2, I've started to take hot showers on board and taking showers that aren't like 30 seconds long, but actually kind of like a normal shower. It's totally possible to get used to taking very short cold showers and being salty all the time but it is truly enjoyable. Like I experienced visceral pleasure by taking nice long hot showers. <laughs> Did you have your beer in the shower? Before? Oh yes. <laughs> oh yes, that just made my day. Good job, <laughs> I'm man. like on top of the world right now. And so that's an example of something that we're hoping to be able to accomplish and to do out in the middle of nowhere while we're seeing some of the most remote parts of the planet. Now, in addition to luxury items and amenities, I think it's also important to discuss the fact that there's a lot of sailing and cruising tools that used to be only something that big expensive yachts could afford and use that are now totally accessible to most sailors. And those are things like radar, AIS, chart plotters, multifunction displays, satellite communications, and electronic autopilots. These things are not absolutely necessary for sailing around the world, and so many people have shown us that, from the parties to the Hiscox, all the old school cruisers. But I would argue that these tools can reduce the risk involved with sailing offshore and sailing long distances. Obviously, if you don't use them right, if you rely on them too much, they can actually be a hindrance, but I think they can actually make sailing safer. And with smaller boats being able to produce and store the kind of electricity needed to run these systems, more and more people are going to be able to use these risk-reducing tools. Now, there's no such thing as a free lunch, and there is a drawback to these advanced systems, and that is that they dramatically increase the complexity and sophistication of the electrical system. 
So the installation is going to be much more complicated, much more expensive, much more involved. Um, safety concerns are more of an issue. I mean, whenever you're dealing with huge amounts of electricity, like a lot of these new systems do, fire is always going to be at the top of your safety concern list. And when you have lots and lots of electricity flowing through a system, you just have to have more robust safety solutions. And they're out there, but you gotta do your homework to make sure that those safety systems are in place. Now, there is so much to learn when it comes to building and designing a high-tech electrical system like this on a boat and we wanted to make sure that we did it right that we did it the best way possible we had good information we're making the right decisions and we just didn't feel comfortable doing this on our own from the beginning so that's why we decided to work with ocean planet energy now, we actually found out about this company from Nigel Calder when we interviewed him at the 2019 Annapolis Boat Show. Now, Nigel Calder is one of our sailing heroes and mentors. He's written a lot of awesome books, including The Cruising Guide to Cuba, which we used while we were there. His electrical and mechanical maintenance manual is like a Bible on our boat. And Nigel is a partner of Ocean Planet Energy, along with CEO Bruce Schwab. Well, Ocean Planet Energy, or OPE as we like to say, provides energy storage and charging systems that can charge much faster than, than traditional systems and allows much more energy to be available for running your loads and applications. So we provide the integrated systems, including batteries, charging systems, which could be alternators or inverter chargers or just AC-DC chargers, solar panels, solar charge controllers, alternators, regulators. Uh, we provide these as an integrated package with guidelines and support to get these systems installed. Most boats have an engine and they already have diesel, so if you, rather than have a generator to provide energy, if you already have a diesel engine, you put a high power alternator on it, every time you motor the boat, or even if you're just gonna run the engine itself, you're gonna get the most energy possible out of a given amount of fuel. If you're going to motor the boat anyway, then you might as well, you should never have to finish motoring and not have your batteries be fully charged. And they have a lot of energy to use until the next time you need to motor or charge. And so they were able to walk us through the entire process, which began with filling out a load calculator sheet. So basically what the load calculator is, it's a spreadsheet on Google Docs, which is really cool because I can edit it and everyone that's shared on this doc can see it and access it. And I pretty much just go through the sheet and add up all of the loads, the electrical loads that we're gonna use on any sort of a average basis and try to figure out a somewhat realistic figure of how much electricity we use in a given day. And so here at the top, you can see we've got the AC loads. We put down the amperage here of each device, and then we have the hours per day of use for each thing. And so you can see here, we've got our TV uh, hours per day of use, three hours. Now, are we gonna watch three hours of TV every single day? No, but I, we're trying to create I guess maybe an average day, if not a slightly worse than average day, like a fairly high electrical usage day. And then down here, you can see it has results for our AC loads. So here's the total watt hours for the AC loads. Here's the corrected watt hours per day for AC loads. And I believe that that correction is actually from the inefficiency of an inverter. There's typically like a 15% loss or inefficiency when you're turning 12 volt DC into 110 AC. And then they convert the watt hours to 357 amp hours per day for the AC loads. Now this is super high. Of the 3,700 watt hours per day that we're, that we're coming up with, about 3,000 of that comes directly from our computers. It's important to remember though that our laptops aren't normal average laptops. These are high performance machines designed specifically to do like real time editing of 4K footage and stuff like that. So they use more power than a typical laptop. Then if I scroll down here, uh, we'll see that we've got another section for DC loads. So this is for the 12 volt system. And now some of these, it was really hard to figure out exactly how many hours per day we're gonna use them. And so for instance, you know, something like the fresh water pump, 
I mean, the fresh water pump is only on maybe 50% of the time that we're actively flowing water out of the system. So whether it be showering, doing dishes, washing our hands, brushing our teeth, we definitely don't know with any amount of accuracy how many hours a day we do that, but we, we were able to kind of estimate. So by far, the highest electrical draw on the DC side is going to be our refrigerator compressor. And that makes sense, because this is a big refrigerator. We keep it to the point where the bottom is kind of like a freezer and the top is a refrigerator. And so it requires a lot of electricity to accomplish that, to cool that large of an area down. The next biggest draw, which is about half as much, is actually our interior fans, which is really interesting. I would not have guessed that. Um, a lot of the reason for that is because I've got here that we would use two fans, a quantity of two, for 24 hours a day. That can happen. It's not very common, but in the tropics, if it's really hot and there's not a lot of breeze, Desiree and I will both at all times have a fan on each of us. And so if we don't leave the boat that day, then we have two fans running for 24 hours. And then, you know, I thought, well, definitely like the water maker needs to be a huge draw, right? So that's got to be next. But no, the next highest electrical draw is the WeBoost cellular booster. And that's because I've got that running for 12 hours a day. Now, when we're cruising the Caribbean, that's actually the primary way that we get internet is we have uh, cellular data, but we're not always in areas that have really good cellular signal. And so because high-speed internet is so important to what we do, we have to use things like cell boosters. Are we always going to use a cell booster for 12 hours a day? No. Are we often gonna use one for 12 hours a day? No. But it can happen and we wanna make sure the electrical system is up to the challenge. That's one issue with this whole exercise is it's so theoretical and there's so many nuances to the story of how and how much we use our electricity on the boat that it's very difficult to get an accurate representation of an average electrical usage day. So once we add all these up, we scroll down and we see that uh, there's the total for the DC loads on the house bank, which adds up to 191 amp hours per day. If you combine that with the AC loads, you get 550 amp hours per day. Now that's super, super high. I bet you that we won't use that much electricity, maybe but 10% of the time. But we wanted to make sure that the electrical system could handle these worst case scenario days. Now, one of the really interesting things about this exercise, other than ending up with this very important final number, it's really great to know that like right now our interior lights are using about as much electricity, if not more, as the water maker will. That's mind blowing, right? Like if we are careless about how much we use these lights, which right now they're uh, old school like fluorescent lights, we could definitely upgrade them to LED and that would help. But still, if we are really careless about how we use our lights at night, we could be using the same amount of electricity as making all the fresh water that we need to shower and to do our dishes and to, and to get by. Another thing that was really important is down here, you can see we did a load calculator sheet for our underway loads. And uh, you can see that we have a whole lot less AC loads. I just have the coffee maker and charging our drone batteries. Um, and then on the DC side, we actually have a lot more loads. So the electronic autopilot. This was another tricky one because electronic autopilots use a lot of electricity when the waves are really big and they're, it's having to correct a whole lot all the time compared to when it's you know real nice and calm out. And actually, the AC plus DC loads is 500 amp hours, which is even less than our at anchor loads because we don't have our computers running. So now we have this magic number of 550 amp hours, which is what Ocean Planet Energy needs to start to design our new electrical system. So the first item on Ocean Planet Energy's proposal was that we switch to lithium batteries. And they wanted us to do that for a couple of reasons. 
Lithium batteries are awesome. They're a lot better than AGM or lead acid batteries in, in lots of different dimensions. First of all, they're more energy dense. So they can store more electricity for a given amount of weight than can lead acid batteries or AGM batteries. Another thing that's great about lithium is that you can effectively use about 90% of the capacity of the battery day in and day out and not really damage the long-term health of the battery. Whereas with AGM or other lead acid batteries, you really only want to discharge to like 50% on a regular basis. Some brands say that you can discharge to more than that, but the fact is is that if you start discharging more than 50% on a conventional lead acid or AGM battery, you're going to significantly reduce the lifespan of that battery. And so our last battery bank was 420 amp hours. This new battery bank that Ocean Plan Energy proposed is 600 amp hours. Now you'd think looking at the surface of that that it's 50% more electricity that we can use. But because the 600 amp hour bank we can use 90% of that and the 420 amp hour bank we can use 50% of that, then in reality, we're more than doubling the amount of available electricity to us given our space restrictions in our battery compartment. If we want to be able to handle that huge daily load of 550 amp hours while at anchor, then we need a battery bank that can actually have 550 available amp hours. Now, we're going to have things like solar panels. And so there's no way that we will ever actually just use all of our batteries electricity all in one day. But the battery bank theoretically should at least be able to handle that in the event that we need to do that. Which brings me to another of the big highlights of lithium batteries, and that is that they can be charged much faster than traditional AGM or lead acid batteries. The lithium batteries that Ocean Planet Energy recommended, lithionics, are recommended to be charged at an amperage that is half of their capacity. So a 600 amp hour bank can be charged with a constant input of 300 amps. That is way more than a lead acid or AGM battery bank would allow. Now, there are some drawbacks to lithium batteries. And to me, the main one is the fact that they are very expensive. But another way to look at this is that although they're more expensive, they last a whole lot longer. They have a whole lot more cycles in their lifespan. And so to me, it's sort of like, do you wanna buy a crappy pair of shoes every year for the next five years? or do you wanna buy really nice expensive shoes that'll last you five years? It, it's essentially the same thing. It just depends, do you wanna put your money up front or do you wanna pay your money slowly over time? Now, I think that for that reason, lithium might not be the best option for somebody who will only be owning a boat for a year or two, but for us, knowing that we want to own the boat for at least 10 years, it's more or less just an investment. Another thing to think about is that when switching to lithium batteries, the entire electrical system needs to be updated because lithium runs on kind of a totally different setup. So battery chargers, battery monitors, alternator regulators, solar regulators, all those things need to be updated so that they're compatible with lithium. And finally, I think the big concern that most people have with lithium is safety, right? We've all heard stories about cell phones catching on fire and lithium batteries can potentially be a fire hazard. Now I'll go into more detail into this once we actually install our Lithionics batteries, but suffice to say, say that Lithionics, the company that manufactures the batteries that we're going with, have implemented safety measures that are just foolproof. And you can literally drive a nail into these batteries, you can drill into these batteries, you can just totally mess with these batteries, and they're not gonna catch on fire, and those kind of core safety concerns just aren't an issue. Not to mention that they wrap these batteries with like fireproof material, and I mean the whole thing is just so solidly constructed that it's not the same thing as the batteries in the past that have posed safety issues. So now that we've kind of dealt with the electrical capacity side and storage, the next we had to start thinking about 
charging and how we were going to recharge this new battery bank. First of all, Ocean Planet Energy recommended that we pretty much put up as much solar as we possibly can. But they were saying that given the fact that the boat has a canoe stern, the cockpit's not that big, basically the solar real estate on the boat is not that great. We just can't put up enough to probably deal with these super high theoretical loads that someday we may have to deal with. And now the whole solar component of this installation is gonna happen in a while once we get down to North Carolina. We're working with Pacific Seacraft, who's building us a Bimini and a solar array. And so we'll get into that at a later date. But because we know for a fact that at times our future solar array won't be able to deal with a lot of these loads that we're hoping to be able to draw, we need to have a way of recharging the battery bank quickly and efficiently other than using solar. And so Ocean Planet Energy recommended that we take a look at some high output alternators. And alternators basically generate electricity using the power from our engine. And traditionally, like the alternator that's on the boat right now is an 80 amp alternator. But like we were saying, our future lithium battery bank can handle 300 amps. So that's a whole lot more than 80. So Ocean Planet Energy recommended that we go with a 360 amp alternator that we can then dial down to max out at 300 amps. And that's going to allow us to basically completely recharge the bank if it's totally dead in like two hours. And most of the time, if it's only 50% or something like that, we could completely recharge in one hour. And what that means is less engine runtime, right? On Atticus 1, like I said, sometimes when we would have to edit an episode or two, we would run the engine like five hours a day. And that was a huge bummer because it's loud, it makes the cabin hot, it's annoying to our neighbors, and it adds engine hours to the engine so that we have to do more maintenance more often. So in theory with this new alternator, as we head out of an anchorage to get out into open water to go for a sail, that 30 minutes that it takes us to motor from the anchorage out into open water, we'll probably be able to completely top up our batteries and then have a lot of electricity for the rest of the day. Now, another way that boats have solved this problem in the past of wanting to be able to generate a lot of electricity is having a actual generator on board and that works well with the exception of you know you have another engine that you need to maintain and the fact that you need a lot more space it's you know there's a whole compartment that you need to be able to mount this new generator into so to me the neat thing about these new alternators is that they're kind of replacing generators why have two engines on the boat if you can just make the one engine do both jobs so anyway it's gonna be one hell of a journey I mean there's so much for me to learn there is so many little details to work out but we just can't be more excited about out, kind of taking our new home to the next level and really being able to see if this experiment of living kind of a normal modern life aboard a cruising sailboat is even possible. So next week we're going to dive into the actual system design that OPE sent us as well as to start to dive into the installation itself. So we'll see you guys then. Hey guys, thanks so much for checking out this week's episode. I wanted to let you know that Jordan and I are going to be at the U.S. Annapolis Sailboat Show this October, and we are so excited. We hope to see you there. Um, so if you haven't bought your tickets yet for that, you can use the code ATTICUS2021 to get $5 off. Also, we are so excited because we are going to be hosting a boat buying seminar on Sunday, October 17th, and we're going to go over all of the lessons we learned through our boat buying process. So if you watched our boat buying series, which ultimately led us to buy this specific Seacraft 40, which we are in love with, um, then definitely check that out. And we're going to be going over a lot of the lessons we learned, uh, a lot of the things that we wish we knew when we started the boat buying process, and some lessons we've learned since buying Atticus too. Also, we are going to be doing a ton of events and hangouts at the boat show so that we get a chance to hang out with you. So if you want to check those out, stay tuned, and we're going to be posting a bunch of sign-up sheets over the next couple of weeks. And if you're not a patron yet, this is a great 
time to hop on board because we're going to be hosting a bunch of really fun patron only events as well. And speaking of really fun events, we would love to go on a sail with you at the boat show. So we've got three sails on the schooner woodwind and one of them is totally sold out. Another one only has two spots left and then our Monday sale um, has I think 11 spots yet. So if you want to hang out with us on the water, I will link to that information in the description below. Other than that, hope you guys have a great weekend and we'll see you next week.